Hello, welcome back everybody. It's been a busy couple months since last video. Um, I've changed my upload schedule, so now instead of every two weeks like I did last time, I'm going to now only be uploading every time I reach a milestone. So if you like these videos, make sure you subscribe so that way you're notified when the next one comes out. Now let's see, where did we leave off last time? Wow, looks like we got a lot of catching up to do. The next thing on my list to develop after the art editor was the asset browser. My first sketch of the UI had the browser looking more like a tree with collapsible categories, but I didn't like the look of this and realized it would be a pain to get working in CSS. So I figured it's time to update. And what's the first step for updating something? If you said redesign the entire user interface in Affinity Designer, you'd be correct. And also horribly inefficient, but that's what I did, and totally not just as an excuse to procrastinate doing real work. It does help though, as now I'm not limited by pixel resolution, and it'll also help a bit when I start designing color schemes and stuff. Instead of a tree-based view, I decided to go for one where when you click on the category, the browser slides over to reveal the assets in that list since it felt a little more natural. I also renamed sprites to drawings in the UI as I figured it might be a little bit more accessible to people learning game design. As I finished up the design, it seemed like there was a little tiny voice in my head telling me that I'm forgetting to add something important. Eh, I'll just ignore it for now. With all that done, it's time to get coding. Getting this set up was super simple. The asset browser is split into a left and right side with only one side visible at a time. When an asset category is clicked, the right side is populated with all those assets and the entire thing slides over. Besides the usual, why isn't my CSS working type issues, the code was all pretty straightforward. Views v4 feature also made it super painless to dynamically list things. I don't want to get bogged down with styling too much this early, but I did add this cool little transition which made it feel so smooth. I then wrote a basic parent class for all assets, used it to extend the existing sprite class, and then implemented some placeholder classes for the other asset types. And with that, the asset browser is done. I can now add, select, and delete assets from any category. Looking at this list of asset categories, I can't help but feel the tiny voice from before getting a little bit louder. Oh yeah, uh, kind of forgot about that. In the beginning, there was the sacred trinity of three. The architect, who was the builder of worlds. The artist, who gave color to what the world contained. The logician, whose job it was to orchestrate the functionality of all that exists. Then, one day, from the void, spawned a new entity. This entity was simply known as Object. Object tried to banish the existing three entities. Only the Architect was able to resist, while the other two... <laughs> this is so stupid. Basically, this is the long-winded way of saying I added an object editor. <laughs> The editor was just a bunch of really simple HTML and CSS that used the vModel feature to easily do two-way binding on the object's properties. I even just straight up stole the animation player from the art editor for previewing the sprites. Also, tabs are now selection sensitive. I figured having useless editors sitting around displaying a message like, select a sprite to edit, or select an object to edit, would have just made things more confusing, so instead only the editors that work with the currently selected asset appear. The exception is the level editor, which stays open all the time so you can easily add objects to it. Also, I got rid of the tiles category because any workflow for setting up a tile map system is going to be way too complex for the target audience. I figured blocks can just as easily be made from collision objects, so why have both? There's now a file menu. Since the editor is getting more and more features, the project setups for testing are requiring more and more time to get going. 
so I guess now is as good a time as any to add saving and loading features. All asset classes now have a to save data and a from save data method, which handles serializing and parsing to and from adjacent file. Getting the open button to actually open a file required me to hide one of these on the page and then call it with JavaScript, which feels kind of hacky, but if it works, it works. The other buttons don't do anything yet, but they're good for reminding me what still needs to get done. Okay, so first to add some simple navigation, just like the art editor, right? Add a simple grid, use some vector transformations on it. Hmm, that's, that's not quite right. I, sh I should add more code to fix that. Oh God, what's happening to the grid? What the heck is an affine transformation? Why is everything on fire? I didn't even program that in. Oh, okay, so I just had to move that one line down. Perfect, got it first try. Now that that's all over, time to add some instances. This is where things got a little interesting from the programming side. I needed a data structure to hold them, which would make selecting and collision checking fast and easy, but also one that would allow me to get all the instances ordered by depth for drawing. I settled on this weird Frankenstein's monster of a data structure I'm calling spatial collection. Basically, it works by having a fixed grid of cells. When an instance is added, its position is hashed to put it in one of these cells. The hash function is just rounding the position to the nearest cell, and each cell is just a list of all the instances contained in that cell. This means if I want to check for collision or if the users clicked on it, I can just hash the position of the object or cursor and check for the overlap only against the instances in that cell or the neighboring cells. I also need a list of all instances in all cells. So when an instance is added to a cell, it's also added to another list which is z-sorted. Since JavaScript doesn't support simple pointers, linking the two lists together became a nightmare. And once I got the code working, I shut the code in a deep dark vault and never opened it again. Adding and changing instances was easy though. In order for everything to work with the undo redo system, all tasks in the editor have an action reversion pair. This resulted in a lot of code, but it was worth it in the end for how simple it made debugging and troubleshooting. The rendering code was dead simple and just used the transformation method that I already programmed for the grid. Since parsing the sprite data and drawing it on the canvas is pretty slow, I set up a caching system so that the first time the sprite is drawn, it's cached to a map list using the sprite's asset ID as a key. This way, the next time it needs to be drawn, it just takes the full image out of the cache and draws it using the browser's native draw image function. I started to think about what would happen if an object didn't have a sprite, or the sprite was empty, and realized it would be almost impossible to select it in the editor if that happened. Now if the instance doesn't have a sprite or the sprite is empty, it'll draw a placeholder SVG that won't be visible in the game. I also added a small panel on the right that can be used to edit room, camera, and individual instance settings. And that's it! I was done! I can finally move on and check this off my list. Oh no. I'm hearing that voice again. I forgot to add in an exits feature. And that's when I took a break for a couple months. I was so excited to finally be done with the level editor that when I realized I had this pretty decently sized feature left to work on, it just kind of drained all the momentum I had. Like not only was this gonna require a lot of coding, but I also had to figure out a way to shove it into my existing design that wasn't meant for it. I took a break over the holidays, then January, then February, and finally in March, I got to work adding exits and finished them up in a couple days. The UX is a little weird, like the only way to remove them is to go into the properties and click the delete button. But setting the destination is as easy as selecting the room from the dropdown, then selecting from the available exits in that room. One weekend long bug sprint later and I could finally add that fantastic check mark to my to-do list. And you know what? This time I don't hear any little voice in my head. I hope you enjoyed this video. Not being constrained to that two week schedule meant I had a lot more freedom to just have fun and be silly with it. I enjoyed editing this video, um, so I hope you enjoyed watching it. If you would like to help support this channel and this project, the links to support me are down in the description below. And as always, I will see you next time.